Let's so, do it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> so hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weird Road to Gonzo, Hunter S. Thompson's Savage Journey. Tonight, we'll be hearing from author Peter Richardson, and he will be interviewed by Matthew Felix. My name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians on staff at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest, in fact, designed to serve the general public here in California. Mechanics is also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Yes, we have two oldest in our description. <laughs> um, right now, since the pandemic is wrapping up, the Institute is open six days a week and uh, we continue to host virtual events, but are gradually offering in-person activities. So I hope to see you there. Um, we are a membership organization, so I encourage you to visit us and consider whether or not you want to join. Membership is only $120 a year. And with that, you really help support our continued contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, our um, guest speaker, uh, Peter Richardson, will be interviewed by Matthew Felix. So let me introduce Matthew. He is an author and a podcaster and a regular speaker at the Mechanics Institute. He has interviewed New York Times bestselling authors, leaders of major local organizations like Litquake and the Mill, Val Mill Valley Film Festival and the San Francisco Writers Conference. Um, and what else has he done? He also regularly speaks at Mechanics and elsewhere about all kinds of subjects ranging from creativity to podcasting to marketing for authors. I encourage you to check out his books they are available at the Mechanics Institute's library and for sale on online venues like amazon.com or at your local bookstore. And the book that we're gonna be talking about tonight, Savage Journey, is um, part of the Mechanics Library's collection and also available for purchase locally. We like to use Alexander Book Company because they are just across Market Street from us and they can ship you books very quickly, like faster than Amazon, within 72 hours. So um, I encourage you to take a look at their bookshop. And let me turn it over to Matthew. Thank you, both of, both of you, for coming and joining us today. Thank you, Taryn, for having us. Uh, and thanks for such a, such a nice introduction. Let me now pass it pass it forward or pay it forward, as we say, and let me introduce Peter. Peter Richardson has written critically acclaimed books about the Grateful Dead, Ramparts Magazine, and radical author and editor Carrie McWilliams. The New York Times and Mother Jones have excerpted his work, and his essays have appeared in The Nation, The New Republic, The San Francisco Chronicle, Lit Hub, Guernica, and lots of other places. A busy book reviewer in 2013, Peter received the National Entertainment Journalism Award for online criticism. He has a PhD in English from UC Berkeley, and since 2006, he has taught courses on California culture at San Francisco State. As Taryn just said, tonight we're here to talk about his new book, Savage Journey, Hunter S. Thompson and the Weird Road to Gonzo, which Kirkus Reviews called a lively loping study of Hunter S. Thompson as literature. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Matthew. So uh, lots of books already out there about Thompson, uh, including some of his own, obviously. So I'm curious, what was it that you felt hadn't been sufficiently explored or, or, or touched on or addressed relative to, to Thompson that you thought, you know, I wanna, I wanna kind of explore that with, with this new book? Yeah, you're right. There are many biographies, kind of a short shelf of biographies that are already out there. They started coming out in the early 90s, and I, I love all of them. I mean, I've read them all, obviously, and, and there's some, you know, great documentary and by Alex Gibney, and there's, there's plenty to read if you, if you want to read about Thompson. Most of it is about his life and his persona, especially, and, and you know, it's very attractive. It's what made him a celebrity, really, uh, beginning in the 1970s. <clears throat> what we haven't seen a lot of is what he achieved as a writer. And that's actually a harder sort of thing to write about than it might 
sound, even though he was a professional writer, partly because his persona began to sort of eclipse some of his work in all of his work in the, in the public imagination, that his persona, that his kind of gun totaling, gun toting rather, uh, booze swigging, um, sort of raucous, wild persona was really the thing that made it hard to really go back and look at what he wrote. And he commented on that during his lifetime. He said, you know, it's funny, almost nobody ever asked me about the writing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, hey, that's a that's an opportunity to go back. It's not it's not the sexy part, you know. It's not the thing that the vast majority of people are drawn to, which is the kind of Gonzo persona. But I, you know, because of my because of the work that I've done before, it was a sort of entree to that kind of question. I felt like I had a running start on it, so I decided, you know, I'm going to go ahead and give it a try now. That aside, I mean, I do teach this material at San Francisco State University, so it, it was a great blend with what I was already teaching. Right. And so it just felt like, hey, if I'm going to do it, I should do it now. 50th anniversary, by the way, of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. By the way, perfect timing. And it might not be the sexy part, but the book is is fascinating. I mean, I, I really enjoyed reading this book, and I think there's it's plenty sexy enough, and it's just... I mean, you just touched on so much local history as we're going to talk about and just his process. And so we're going to talk about all of that. But um, but let, let's talk about the myth, because like you said, he himself even recognized he said in 1978, you say in your book, quote, you know, the myth has taken over. He said that about himself, like you said, so he even realized it. So what was it? Um, well, well, let's characterize the myth. I mean, you kind of touched on it, the gun toting, the alcohol, but uh, tell us a little bit more about, about, about the myth itself of what he came to be in that sense. Well, he always had a huge personality and was a very charismatic guy. Um, I mean, you can go back and, and read about his youth in Louisville, Kentucky. He comes out to California, but he's still pretty much a traditional journalist during that time. He has a lot of swagger and attitude, but it's nowhere near the kind of persona that we see in the, emerging in the 1970s. And, and there were many reasons for it. Part of it had to do with the outlet that he was writing for. Most, most, of, most of the stuff, most of the gonzo journalism that he wrote uh, came out uh, from Rolling Stone magazine. And Rolling Stone was created in San Francisco in 1967. It's really hard to imagine how the gonzo myth would have been established without an outlet like Rolling Stone. And right. so... There were a lot of things that went into the construction of that, of that voice and that myth. And in the book and, and some related articles, I've, I've sort of tried to break that down. Uh, I think it really begins to emerge. I mean, obviously, he has a big national bestseller with the, with the Hells Angels, with Hells Angels, the book that he wrote while he was in San Francisco. Right. It comes out just that. after he's moved to, to Colorado. But it's not Gonzo. That's not Gonzo. It's it's a it's a critical and commercial success. But but Gonzo emerges over the next um, four or five years, and it's almost an accident, really. And I hope we can have time to really explore that because it was not a conscious project. Okay. Yeah. And we are gonna we are gonna explore that. But before we move on to the myth or away from the myth, so an aspect of that that's interesting to me is he played into it. So later on, it's sort of going to come back in a way to bite him in the sense that, again, it's going to overshadow part of his legacy. But for a long time, he played into it. So can no you doubt. speak to kind of how he did that? Because it was some very colorful how he played into it. I mean, I think there were wigs involved and some mm -hmm. of the, he was, there were almost like costumes involved in addition to some of the stuff you've already talked about. So can you, can you speak to sort of how he played that up? as that myth started to take shape and also how it served him. I mean, because he wasn't just doing it for fun. It was also serving a, a purpose, I think, at different points in his career. That's right. I mean, it actually starts with the publicity for Hell's Angels. He starts being more and more performative in, in public. And, and some of his friends, like the novelist William Kennedy says, what's with the get up? You know, what, what happened? What, how right, did you, right. <laughs> what, why are you starting down this road? But Kennedy was sharp enough to see that, in fact, you know, the wilder and more theatrical uh, Thompson's life became, the more he had to write about. So, so it's this sort of, it's a generative process that the wilder and crazier he gets um, in his writing and in, then in his life, the, the, that's grist for his mill. Mm -hmm. 
It's sort of and art he, imitating life, imitating art sort of thing. Right. And so mm -hmm. Gonzo first knew journalism and then Gonzo becomes, you know, a kind of forum for the author really to stage himself or herself and in a first person narration where the author is part of the story, unlike in traditional journalism um, and, you know, that preceded Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion and, and right. um, Hunter Thompson. So yeah, so let's, um, well, actually, before we move to that, another something, another aspect to this myth that was interesting to me, and then I do want to talk about new journalism specifically, but another part of the myth that was interesting to me insofar as how it served him was later on, when he wasn't producing as much output, he was able to almost sort of hide behind it a little bit. Is that a correct sort of take on it? Oh, I think so. I mean, once it took him a while to realize that the gon his gonzo persona was his most valuable literary asset. Once he understands that, and we're talking about 1971, 1972, um, once he gets that, he is very reluctant to let it go. Mm -hmm. Even even though his friends are advising him, come on, you know, <laughs> give it a rest. Right. You know, keep moving, keep moving on. And and you know, I think that was hard for him, partly because even though he understood, as you said, that the myth was taking over in some ways, and he struggled with that a little bit. I think as a as a as a freelancer for his whole career, it was really hard for him to resist the kinds of, you know, the publicity and celebrity that he got from being the, the wild, crazy uh, gonzo journalist. Right. Okay, so that's the myth, which, as we said, is going to overshadow the writing. But let's, let's now move to new journalism and, and gonzo journalism as well and the writing. But can we just sort of define just quickly, you did just allude to Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion, um, but for those who might be in attendance, who might not be particularly familiar with new journalism, can you define that? Because that's kind of where he's starting. Right, really new journalism starts in the, in the mid 1960s. Tom Wolfe is usually seen as the person who brings it forward. He's writing for New York elites, mostly New York uh, Magazine and, and other outlets in, in New York City. Many of his stories are actually set on the West Coast. Same with Joan Didion, um, who was doing a uh, very similar thing. But the main thing is the importation of literary techniques into traditional magazine journalism so that you bring in dialogue, you, you know, the, the, the writer becomes a character in the story. It's first person narration. There's a certain kind of scene setting that you might not see in traditional journalism, which was more, you know, who, what, when, where, and how. Right. And so it becomes more and more literary. The voice becomes more distinct and more important. And, you know, um, Thompson really saw that as an opportunity for him. He never really wanted to be a traditional reporter. He wanted to write novels. Mm -hmm. So did Tom Wolfe, so did Joan Didion. So those new journalists, and there were others, of course, are really kind of working that sort of crease between, between journalism and fiction. Right. Um, from the beginning. Right. So let's look at how he went from new journalism and sort of chart his literary formation to to the point where he evolved sort of to, to gonzo journalism. And one of the things you really highlight in your book is that, and, and you've already touched on a little bit, actually, is that this was largely a San Francisco story, which, of course, is of much interest to us here tonight. So can you elaborate on that a little bit more? I mean, you mentioned Rolling Stone, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Rolling Stone. Uh, but can you just kind of paint the picture for, you know, what's going on? And again, we're talking about what well, he says, actually, I, I got a quote here, quote, San Francisco was clearly, and this is from him, San Francisco was clearly the best place in the world to be living, to be living in those years, 1960 to 1970, to be specific. And my memories of life in that purest of tornadoes still cause me to babble and jabber and dance. So I love that line, obviously. Mm -hmm. But what's going on in, the, in, that, in that decade and how specifically then is it informing sort of his lit, literary evolution? Right. So he, you know, he's not from here. He's from, he's from Kentucky and he, he sort of, he joins the Air Force. He moves around. He, he um, takes a job to drive a car across country and then he hitchhikes to San Francisco in 1960. So, and the reason he does that is, is largely because he's very interested in the beats. Right. And he, he goes around and visits all the beach shrines, city lights books and other, other places. And uh, he looks for work at the Examiner and the Chronicle. He can't, can't find a job there. And he goes down and lives in Big Sur. And that's a place where it's, it was, uh, especially at that time, was a kind of, um, you know, a kind of art colony. 
And one of his big heroes, Henry Miller lives there, but he also meets some other working writers, journalists, uh, musicians, and other kinds of artists there. And he really, it really becomes, um, you know, a good place for him, but he wears it out very quickly. He's, he writes something about Big Sur that is not popular locally. He writes it for a, a men's magazine. It's actually his first publication in a, na in a national magazine. And, you know, he leaves, he leaves town and he, he does some, some other work in uh, South America, but he returns to the Bay Area. Now he's married and he, uh, he comes to Glen Ellen, which is where I'm sitting right now in Sonoma County. And, um, you know, nothing has really lifted off yet in San Francisco. He moves to Parnassus Avenue, 318 Parnassus in, New York, in San Francisco, just outside of Haight-Ashbury. And that's when things really begin to begin to click. And he um, he covers the 1964 GOP convention. He's trying to cover the, the Berkeley student activism. And he gets a story idea from Kerry McWilliams, editor of The Nation, who's another California person, expert, and ends up writing about the Hells Angels. And that that's really the liftoff. And then shortly thereafter, the Haight-Ashbury becomes this kind of seedbed for all kinds of other um, art projects and music and journalism and dance and film. And so uh, that really is his element. That's right. where he really, you know, is formed in many ways as, as a writer. He becomes friends with Ken Kesey and, you know, and that he's not there very long, you know, he's mm -hmm. gone by the by fall of 1966. But mm -hmm. those two or three years are very, very formative for him. Yeah. And one of the really formative elements that um, that becomes sort of a, a component of gonzo journalism, and like you said, this actually is kind of the Hells Angels, his experience writing the article in the book for the Hells Angels actually pre predates what ends up becoming gonzo journalism. But one of the key components comes out of that experience. And it's also sort of related to he was a huge critic of the media. And so related relative to this story that he's writing on the Hells Angels, he says, the traditional journalistic approach wasn't enough. He says that instead the story, that sort of story, quote, require, required the kind of participatory journalism that he alone was willing and able to provide. So like I said, that becomes a key aspect of Gonzo journalism, the journalist as participant, um, not just as ostensibly objective witness. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on that a little bit and how the Hell's Angels story kind of helped, helped right, him kind right. of get to that place? So he gets the story idea, he, and through some connections, he's able to kind of embed himself with the Hells Angels and ride with them for two or three weeks. He files the story, and the story is popular enough for him to get some, some book contracts. And then he spends a year riding with the Hells Angels, and he, and he um, finishes the book, and it becomes a bestseller. So, um, and it's all participatory. And I think it's especially important for him because it's almost impossible to imagine Tom Wolfe or Joan Didion embedding themselves with the Hells Angels. Right, you know, right. It takes a certain right. kind of, you know, physical courage and kind of brawniness and, and kind of thick hide to really even pull this off in the first place. And he gets, he dines out on that for quite a while afterwards. He gets the kind of respect that's usually reserved for war correspondence, a respect for bravery mm -hmm. in a way. And so that becomes an important part of his, of his cachet. Right. Um, but that's, that's real new journalism stuff. What, what distinguishes it from Gonzo is Gonzo essentially, instead of reporting on a story that's, that's underway, Gonzo in, in, in many cases becomes a situation where Thompson shows up and creates the scene that he then reports on, you know, and that, yeah. and then, then the, then the entire, the, the universe reveals its meaning through his, through his own kind of warped consciousness. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the Kentucky Derby, Yeah. but I want to ask you one more thing about his San Francisco mm -hmm. sort of a uh, story aspect to his background. And I also want to say that we have someone, I believe, because we're doing the, um, what's it called, the, the webinar, I can't see, but I think we will have someone here who actually also rode with the Hells Angels, if Kate is here tonight, and I'm sure she's gonna have a question. Uh, but anyway, so another aspect of the, of the San Francisco story, part of his sort of, again, evolution was Rolling Stone. Like you said, at the time, Rolling Stone was actually published here in San Francisco. 
And one of the reasons that his success was so closely tied to Rolling Stone is because they put up with him, right? They put up with his process. Mm -hmm. And because his process was so out there, I think that that's really important. Another sort of very important aspect of his of him to, to touch on. So can you talk about his 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 process for producing for, for writing as a writer? Yeah, I mean, early on until Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, let's say, I don't think his writing was that much different. His process was that much different than a lot of writers. You know, he did multiple drafts. Um, you know, he sent it to editors. They gave him notes. He tried to fix it. And I mean, he wasn't an easy writer to work with, but that was that was the basic process. Um, after the success of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which which was published by Rolling Stone in the magazine, then it becomes a book. He said he never rewrote, he never revised a manuscript after that. And so, and th this is also the part where his, his, um, his own personal life is becoming more and more fantastical in a, in a way, right? It's just like um, his life is gone, so not just his writing. He's living the myth, sort of. He's living into it. And he's sort of, sort of over time, he, he thinks he, he should do that, that he's expected to do that. And, um, and he, li he likes the celebrity and the attention and the, and the income and everything else, but it does begin to affect his writing process to the point where he needs greater and greater, you know, interventions of editorial talent to finish the piece. Right. And I want to get really specific with that because as a writer myself, what was interesting was he's throwing it. He's, th he's th oftentimes it sounded as if it was somewhat dependent on where he was in his drug or alcohol or tantrums. It sounds like, you know, it varied a lot, but it oftentimes my impression was that he's throwing these bits and pieces, these unfinished pages, okay. these raw pages. Like you said, he doesn't have to do multiple drafts, lucky him. Um, but then there are people, particularly when he's on a drug binge or an alcohol binge and staying up for days at a time and then sleeping for days at a time, there are these, these, these poor editors who are just there kind of waiting yeah. and, and sort of having to mimic his completely unsustainable, unhealthy rhythm. Yes. And so but, but what I was wondering as a writer is, well, how much of it is his writing then versus if they're taking these random pages and having to yeah. organize them, it, it seemed as if sometimes they were practically co-authors. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to yeah. that i mean am i am i looking too deep there or no he but he was a superstar by then i mean you know early on he but even early like with hell's angels he's drinking every day and mm -hmm. you know not a little bit a lot right. and you know you can't write drunk and so one of the things that kind of helped him finish his assignments is prescription dexedrine prescription speed and and that works for a while that even that combination works for a long time and, um, but it stops working. And that's what happens with dexedrine. You can't, you know, you, you, you can't sustain, you know, you, you get um, immune to it, so mm -hmm. to speak. And that's mm -hmm. about the time that cocaine comes into his life, which he had never really been big on until um, let's say the early seventies, even after he, he does the campaign trail reporting that goes into uh, fear and loathing on the campaign trail, 72. So. You know, with the dexedrine, he's he's basically able for as long as it works. He's he's basically able to kind of to do the work. Right. Then then he's a superstar, so um, he he can ask for, insist upon more and more editorial support, and they're happy to give it to him because this is a franchise. Right. It's great for Rolling Stone. It's the most popular thing that Rolling Stone publishes, and so he gets he gets a bigger break really i mean i don't think anybody else could really get away with Hold it, it right. but no one else was as big as he was he's on the and, masthead yeah and... yeah okay so let's go back to the beginning of gonzo journalism i just mentioned a second ago the kentucky derby story which is at least if i understood correctly in your book it's sort of considered the beginning of gonzo journalism and that article was called the kentucky derby is decadent and depraved which is an awesome title uh, so how and why do we think of that as the beginning? And as part of that, if you could tell us where that term gonzo came into the picture. Sure. Um, let me start with the, the term. It's supplied by his friend, Bill Cardoso, who used to work for the Boston Globe. It was a reaction to the Kentucky Derby piece. He read it and he said, this is totally gonzo, which is a term that, he, that Hunter Thompson had heard him use when they were both covering the 1968 um, primary in New Hampshire. And he just kind of accepted that as a term and decided that was a good label for his own 
brand of journalism. Nobody else really kind of, it doesn't apply fully to, to really anybody else. It's not the name of a genre. It's really right. the name of a kind of specific strain of his work starting in 1970, which is when the Kentucky Derby one comes out. The idea comes from um, a novelist, James Salter, who was living in Aspen. He invites Thompson over for a dinner party, finds out he's from Louisville and says, are you gonna, are you gonna cover the Kentucky Derby, which is always held in Louisville every year? And Thompson thinks, great idea. So he calls Warren Hinkle in San Francisco, who's publishing the uh, magazine Scanlon's Monthly. And he, he gets the, the green light and he goes and, and, and Warren Hinkle pairs him with Ralph Steadman, the illustrator, the British uh, um, illustrator for the first time. They've never met. And it wasn't even Thompson's first pick. It was Warren's pick um, after Thompson's pick um, passed. So they meet in Louisville, they do the piece. He thinks it's a failure. He thinks it's a brutal failure, Thompson does. Uh, he likes the illustrations. He likes Stedman's illustrations. Um, Warren thinks we can work with this, especially when he sees the illustrations. Now, um, Thompson was tearing his hair out trying to finish it. At one point, reportedly, he was just feeding his raw notes into a fax machine right. to try to finish right. this piece. And I think I, you can kind of tell what sections those are because they're jagged and fragmentary and stuff. But it kind of works because his narrator is completely, you know, drunk uh -huh. out, out of his gourd, right? So the fact that he can't really perceive what's going on or, or process it is sort of in keeping with it stylistically with what, with what he's reporting. So it's, it, you know, Thompson's able to lampoon his hometown, which I think is a huge advantage, you know, to really know that terrain the way he knows his hometown and to really know its soft spots and to go directly at it like a missile. And, you know, he gets these crazy illustrations, which is indispensable part of Gonzo's success and reception. And, you know, all of a sudden you have this thing with that Thompson, oh, the other important thing is Thompson sets it against a political backdrop that, that includes the Kent State killings, the bombing of Cambodia. So he just mentions it, it's there in the background, but you do get the feeling that the national political scene is even crazier than what he's reporting on. Right, right. And, and then, you know, he's got the wingman, he's got the car, he calls the car, in this case, the, the Pontiac ball buster. So a lot of the elements of the, of the gonzo um, genre, the staples are sort of there in that piece. No drugs. No it's drugs. All alcohol. Yeah. That's coming. Um, yeah. But what about what about the the importance of of the illustrations? Because they're so readily identifiable, and I don't know if there are a lot of other cases where a writer, in a, particularly in journalism, whatever the genre, that whatever the specific sort of journalism might be, that are so closely the the written word and and the the visual are so closely related. Right. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, I can name some other examples, but I don't think they are as successful as this one. And right. I, I think Thompson always understood that as soon, even before he understood that his article was a success and considered a breakthrough, he knew he wanted to work with Stedman again. You know, Stedman was not uh, kind of doing hippie illustrations. These were not the kind of psychedelic poster art kind of stuff. He wasn't that interested in that. He, can't, he comes from a different kind of tradition, but it was such a perfect counterpoint for Thompson's prose and, you know, there was, there was something about, the, you know, the, the, his exaggerations that were in many ways very much like Thompson's exaggerations, you know, that this just kind of, everything's a little bit kind of distorted and off and over the top. And, you know, so the Ralph Steadman becomes kind of part and parcel of the Gonzo project. In Something a way. I like that you said along those lines is so ostensibly, the, the, the visual artist Stedman is being inspired and sort of illustrating to the words, yeah. but after a certain point, it's, it's actually kind of a mutual inspiration. Thompson is even sort of being inspired in his writing by, by the art. That's so right. I love that sort of that angle yeah. on it. That Isn't that something? Yeah. I mean, you know, Tom, uh, you know, Stedman always turned his stuff right away. You know, he was ready. It mm -hmm. was always Thompson they had to wait for. And sometimes right. Thompson was looking at the art to try to figure out where he wanted to go with his piece. And so, I mean, they really, there really was a team teamwork there and Thompson understood it immediately. And he also understood that there was the potential for a franchise there. Mm -hmm. The problem was that 
that Hinkle's magazine went out of business before they could do another one. And, you know, so he had to table that for a little while. That's when he, that's when he meets Jan Wenner, strikes up a correspondence, begins to submit stuff to Rolling Stone, to Rolling Stone. but no Stedman illustrations. Okay. It's not until they recombine to do the Las Vegas piece that, you know, the franchise that, that Thompson originally imagined comes together so. with even more power right. than the Kentucky Derby piece. So one thing I want to mention that I think he said around this time related to the Kentucky Kentucky Derby piece, and if any, even if he didn't, it's still relevant. But I think I think this was around the same time, because we've talked about how in new journalism, in Gonzo journalism, there there is a subjectivity. It's no, it's it's largely about the the author's experience. It's not pretending to be this again this objective traditional sort of journalism. But Thompson goes a step further, and he says, "quote Fiction is a bridge to the truth that journalism can't reach." So it's not that he's only being subjective. He's actually bringing in fiction. He's bringing in stuff that isn't actually true. And yet he's still calling it journalism, you know, or a, a kind of journalism. So can you speak to how he's able to marry fiction with journalism, even if he's calling it this different thing? That's still kind of tricky, but it's also defining, you know, right. definitive of, of, of his style and what he's doing. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. And part of it, he does say that sort of early in his career, right around the time of the Hells Angels work, he says it to an editor at Random House. It's a pretty unusual thing to say to your editor. It wasn't his editor, but it was somebody he was pitching to. And, you know, I think what he meant by that was his heroes um, were already doing that. You know, George Orwell was already doing that. Jack London was already doing that. Uh, and others that, that you can name. So this idea of participatory reporting, there was nothing new about it. And if it had elements of fiction in it, um, even better for the reason that the quote mentions, because fiction can get at certain kinds of truths that traditional journalism couldn't get at. If you're gonna just list facts, you know, without a point of view, you know, if it's, it's nobody speaking from nowhere, then there are certain truths that are not going to be available to you, to you or the reader. And so he realizes that pretty early on. I, I mentioned already that he wanted to be a, a famous novelist. That was his, that was his long game. It, it never really happened. But as William Kennedy said, of course he, of course he, you know, he, he, he put out fiction, you know, fear and loathing in Las Vegas was fiction. You know, most of what he writes is fiction. And, so, and of course, you know, Kennedy was no slouch in the fiction department either. So, um, you know, there, it's, it's a kind of a hybrid. Uh, I don't think he ever de defended it as reporting. He said, I'm a writer, you know. He did think of himself as a journalist, but, you know, there was always this kind of fantastical element in much of his journalism, which is how somebody could say about one of his books that it was the least accurate and, and say, I know the quote you're thinking of. Yeah, but I can't. Least, I can't remember it off the top of my head. But it was a the great least quote. factual and yeah. most accurate. Account exactly. That was of it. the 1972 campaign. Yeah, and that's. that's but that's only if you're if you're willing to grant that there are different kinds of truths, the kind that journalism can get you to, and the kind that fiction can get you to. And you know, right. he combined those. All right. We'll have to have a whole other hour dedicated to that philosophical uh, conversation. But yeah, I, I loved that that aspect of, of what he's doing. Let's change gears sort of significantly. And I want to talk about a couple of a couple of themes that come up repeatedly, both in his work and in your book when you're looking at his work. And that's this notion and his preoccupation and interest in the American dream that comes up a lot. So can you tell us what did the American dream mean to him? I think he had a kind of old fashioned idea about the American dream, one that one that you can trace back even to the late 18th century. And the fact that he grew up in, in Kentucky, I think, makes somebody like Thomas Jefferson a major figure in thinking about what the what the American dream was. And the idea, and it was very popular in the 1950s, it was made popular by an American historian named Richard Hofstadter, who wrote an essay called The Myth of the Happy Yeoman. Long story short, you know, Jefferson thought that that the, the best way forward for America was to have a kind of a republic of small farmers, essentially, who were independent, you know, who's, who were economically independent in some ways, and who had this kind of civic virtue that, Tom, that Thomas Jefferson thought farmers had. Of course, Jefferson himself was a, was a planter. 
you didn't want sort of urban sophisticates and you didn't want, you know, a kind of um, political class making those, making those calls, you know, and, and, and of course, you know, um, the American history never matched that, that description. It was always a myth. Right. It, it never, it never described the, the, the situation on the ground, but it's a, it's still a very attractive myth in, in American culture to this day. Absolutely. People really want to feel like they're economically independent, even though we're more urbanized, we're more unionized, corporate corporations are more powerful, we're more mechanized, industrialized, all that. So, um, but he, he was very much a believer in that version of the American dream. Now, Hollywood right. had another American dream that it sold, but I right. think that was Thompson's version. So he was also interested in, in addition to that sort of nostalgic American, American dream and that version of it, he was also very interested and in maybe concerned with the dark side of the American dream. And there was one figure in particular who embodied that for him and then who also became sort of an adversary and responsible for a lot of what he ends up writing about for quite a while. Can you, can you speak to who that is and why that political figure was so significant to him? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you're thinking of Richard Nixon. Yes. You get an A. Yes. The professor gets the A. Yes. Um, well, one of his, um, one of Thompson's biographers, William McKean, pointed out that really, you know, Nixon was, was Thompson's muse. I mean, Nixon had a way of drawing out um, some of, some of Thompson's most intense and lyrical even, uh, but dark language and this kind of dark register. And he, he really hated Richard Nixon. Not a lot of people did, but Thompson had a way of going after, after Nixon that most journalists were, they were not ready to go there. There were plenty of journalists, Kerry McWilliams was one who was forever critical of Richard Nixon and was forever pointing out what Nixon was up to. But Nixon continued to win elections. He won two presidential elections and Tom, you know, Nick, uh, rather McWilliams couldn't figure it out. It didn't matter to Thompson. Thompson's point was, I'm going after this guy. You know, it's, he is, he's everything that's rotten about this country. And, and I'm going to expose him and I'm, I'm not going to stick to objective journalism to do it. It's going to be personal. It's going to be this use of invective, which he was quite good at. It was going to be satire, which he was really good at. It was going to be hyperbole and exaggeration, which he was awesome at. So, you know, he took all of these um, tools that he had as a writer and he just directed them at, at Nixon mercilessly. And really, you know, when Nixon's president went, presidency went down in flames, it was a little bit tough for Thompson. Right. You know, I don't think he ever hated anyone quite the way he hated Nixon. And when you, when you, when you describe Nixon, as a werewolf, what do you say about Ronald Reagan? You know, so the hyperbole in, in, in some ways he left himself less running room going forward because he, you know, he just went after Nixon so intensively right. that um, it, it's, it wasn't clear, you know, how, to, how you could change gears or- Where'd I go from here? Direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that's some about his writing. I mean, like I told you before we we started the event. I mean, I easily could have. I had like two or three hours of questions. It was it was very difficult for me to shave it all down because you did so much. I mean, there's so much in this book, and I, I highly recommend this book because I learned so much. It was just fascinating. But so I want to transition now back out of the writing and back to this notion of the myth overtaking the writing, right? Mm -hmm. Because we talked about here's the myth. It's starting to take shape. What is it overshadowing? We just talked about what it his career. Now I want to go back to, to it. It's it starting to actually overshadow. And there's a, there's a great quote in your book that sort of illustrates this. You say, quote, like Jack London, Thompson would soon come to believe that his biggest asset was the character he had built up. His persona, which was fixed to the new genre he was creating, became his most valuable asset. Indeed, it would eventually eclipse his literary output and out loud, out, outlast his most productive period. Then in the Amazon description notes, you say, quote, 50 years after the publication of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and more than a decade after his death, Thompson's celebrity continues to obscure his literary achievement. So I'm just curious, we've talked about how the myth came to be, but do we have a sense for sort of at what point in his career that, 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 that eclipse starts to take place? 
And um, yeah, can you, uh, you're nodding your head. Yes. So yes. So, so can you, I think so. Tell I us think a little bit can. about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's in the mid seventies, um, you know, his, for reasons that we discussed earlier, you know, his ability to sit down and really focus on a piece was, was declining. His, his ex-wife pointed that out actually. Um, you know, he blew some big assignments during that, during that time, you know, he goes to Africa to report on the um, George Foreman, Muhammad Ali fight and doesn't even attend the fight yeah. and doesn't turn in any copy. Oops. So that's, you know, there's some real red flags um, happening around them. It's also around that time that Gary Trudeau introduced. I was just going to say this. Yes. Yeah. I love this part. He didn't, yeah. but I do. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, he didn't like it at all, but Gary Trudeau introduces a character called Uncle Duke into the comic, I mean, the, the political cartoon, Doonesbury. And he wins, he wins a Pulitzer for that right, in 1975, right. I think. So it's right around that time that his fame is, is now going viral, let's say, you know, that he's, I mean, you know, also around that time, he's trying to sell the film rights for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And there's there's some delays because he's he's quarreling with Oscar Acosta, who felt like he deserved some of the some of the film rights for that for that work. Um, but he does sell them, and it, it it produces one film, and then the, there would later be another one with Johnny Depp, both of them based one loosely on Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And a lot of people find out about Hunter Thompson from the movies. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, as, as Bill McKean said, also. Thompson becomes the favorite writer for a lot of people who don't read. Right. That was yeah. another great quote in your book. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's all sort of got, got metastasizing and, you know, a Rolling Stone and Jan Wenner to his credit, I guess, is really um, making Thompson a celebrity in a way. And, and, you know, he's starting to get visits from, you know, Keith Richards and, you know, famous actors and he's running this kind of clubhouse up in the, up um, in his, Aspen or Colorado. Pound, pound, yeah, in Colorado. So, you know, it, he, you know, people are making movies about him, documentary movies. And, and he's one of the most photographed people I think I've ever seen, certainly in the most photographed author. And, you know, so all of this is, is turning into something much larger even than his work. The work becomes, you know, more book based, you know, the journalism. He, he really doesn't write that much. <laughs> for Rolling Stone over, oh, after 1975. There's a big falling out about a story um, that he was supposed to do about Vietnam. Rolling Stone <laughs> sent him to Vietnam. He doesn't really come back with that story either. There's a lot of finger pointing. And so, you know, he has to seek out new outlets, which he does, but more and more of the books become his major source of revenue and the college lectures. Right. And the college lectures also feed the, the celebrity. The yeah, people so, expect to see Raul Duke, mm -hmm. his alter ego. And, and he knows that. And he gets paid 20,000 bucks for every one of those events. And he doesn't give a speech. He I'd be Raul Duke for $20,000 an event. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but let, let's talk about his legacy because we are sort of coming to the end and I do want to leave time for questions. But given that one of the main purposes or, or the main purpose of your book was to help bring shed light on his legacy and on his literary achievement and not just the celebrity, how would you at a high level I mean, again, this this could be another hour long conversation, but at yeah. a high level, how would you summarize that those literary achievements that we want him to be known for ideally? Well, I think he I don't think he maximized his potential. I'm not going to put him at the at the first rank of, mm -hmm. of American writers. What I what I do say in the book is I think he developed the most distinctive um, American voice in the second half of the 20th century. I mean, when you're reading Thompson, you know, you're reading Thompson. Now, there are some competitors. I think Joan Didion might be one, uh, maybe Tom Wolfe, but I think Didion's even, even more notable. Um, but I, I, you know, I think we can you know, support that claim with, with plenty of evidence. I also think that, that his political stuff, though it seemed hyperbolic at the time, it was hyperbolic, but it turns out to be quite prophetic. You know, I don't think he was a political genius. I don't think he was a deep political thinker. But when you go back and read um, his political stuff and his, his stuff on the media, I think he was a very astute media critic as well. It holds up extremely well. And um, so I think there are little areas like that where you, you, have to, you have to give him credit. Other parts of his writing have not aged well. 
And I try to bring those out in the book as well. Right. But I, I don't think he's the sort of guy that you can, um, that you can dismiss because of his shortcomings. Right. I think, you know, generations of people are going to be rediscovering him because of that voice. And so I think that's a literary achievement in and of itself. Um, even though I don't think he really um, did everything that he could have, um, given the given the talent that he had. Yeah. Two last quick questions. One is his his archives are in private hands, and so for anyone who's interested in him and, and, and researching him, that's that's a huge problem. I can't remember if you said eight hundred boxes. I can't remember. There's a lot of archives um, that that we don't have access to. So I'm just curious for someone such as yourself, who has spent so much time researching him. Are there just a couple of high level questions that you would just love to get answered? Or do you have any suspicions of what might be there? I mean, is there something in particular you would be looking for? Mm -hmm. Or is it just sort of supplemental information that would be interesting? Well, it's really the letters after 1975. So there's two volumes of uh, edited correspondence that I love. I think it's the best stuff that Thompson ever did. And I think he thought that too. Um, and a lot of aficionados think that. So some people prefer the, the letters to anything that he wrote for money. And, and I think that goes back to an earlier point that we made that even though you know, his, his literary powers were declining, beginning in the, mid, in the mid 1970s, if you wanna see what his voice sounded like, you can go, always go to the letters. No editors, you know, no haggling, no deadlines. That's, that's what he wrote like, that's what he sounded like. So, right. so I, you know, uh, and then also there was supposed to be a third volume of correspondence. It, it has a title, it has a cover, it has an ISBN number and it never appeared. So I'd like to know why. Yep. And nobody's talking about that. Yep. And, and I'm not sure that those archives will never be made public. I think there's a chance that they will be, that they'll, you know, it's possible that they'll be sold to a, to a research library or something like that. But it is true that a consortium bought and, co and continues to hold that the consortium includes Johnny Depp, who, oh, also, really? paid, oh, who also paid for Thompson's funeral. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, I think there, there is a way that's being very tightly controlled right now. That's not right. unprecedented. Right. William Burroughs' mm -hmm. um, papers are, are in a similar situation, but it gets, it's really hard to, to, to do the kind of research that people like to do if you don't have access to those archives. And he was a pack rat. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff to look through. And so it's very, you know, drives us crazy. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Okay, last question, because we do only have 10 minutes. and I really do want to leave, leave time for Q&A. But you say uh, in the book, quote, in 1996, the Modern Library republished Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which, quote, literally placed Thompson between Jonathan, Jonathan Swift and Henry David Thoreau on the roster of modern library authors. And there's some comparisons to Twain in your book. Yeah. Um, so given again, that the purpose of this undertaking was to, to shine a light on his literary achievements. And I know 1996 was obviously quite a while ago, but I am just curious, do you think we're at a place where he's starting to get that sort of attention or not really? And that's why you're doing this or a little of both? A little of both. I, you know, I think that, that, that he, he still has readers um, and, you know, not just general readers, but people who, who really are amazed by his, by his virtuosity. Yep. And, and, you know, that, that's the thing that that's the trade off in my book is it wasn't really his virtue, his personal virtue that attracted me to him. It was his, it was his literary virtuosity. And I think other people see that too. I mean, anytime, anytime you have a humorist whose stuff holds up well over 50 years, I think that's that's notable. Absolutely. And, you know, like I say, some of, some of it doesn't, but, you know, a lot of people you read, you read his letters or you read his, his most famous books, Hell's Angels, Fear and Loathing Las Vegas, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72. And you're like, wow, you know, 50 <laughs> years old, it's journalism technically, and it's still holding up. That's rare. Yep. Thank you very much, Peter. Let's go ahead and open it up into Q&A. But I just want to, yeah, just encourage everyone again, uh, bookshop.org, amazon.com. Taryn, can, um, what's the name of the, the local bookstore that you mentioned? Alexander's. Alexander's. Alexander. Book Alexander Company. Book Company. Please, uh, uh, Peter, and, and any other place that you want to mention, do you have a website or anything like that that you want to point people to? I have a website, but, but you know, I think, I think the book is the thing that I want people to focus okay. on right now. All right, so go find the book. And Taryn, do we have uh, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. 
Let's see. Uh, Kate has a question. Kate Farrell. Kate, would you like to ask your question directly? Come on down, Kate. Unmute on video. Okay, I just unmuted. Can you? All right, hear we hear yeah. you. Okay, so you know, I I was in San Francisco in my twenties, all during the sixties, and it really was ground zero for so many things that intersected. You know, the literary community, Hell's Angels, beats, hippies, jazz, you know, acid rock, and you know, I. I felt it was very easy to jump from one to the other, even me. And so I know that the Hells Angels were very tough, but, but you could talk to these guys. And I had a boyfriend who rode with him, Oakland Hills. And I'm wondering how much influence did those guys in the mid 60s have on the formation of Hunter Thompson's persona, mm. because that's his asset. And I wonder if he really rubbed shoulders with these guys mm -hmm. and developed a strength of aggression, character, and out, you, you know, you call them savage, and they could certainly be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he had some of those characteristics even before he met the Hells Angels, and that 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 was that enabled him to do the story in the first place. But I do think he learned a lot from being around the Hells Angels, who weren't who weren't terrible at promoting themselves. They had some some ways of getting into the news. Not all of them putting that put them in a good light. But um, I think the I think that experience of of covering the Hells Angels was really, really did change him as a writer. He never had a super high opinion of human nature. And um, I don't think anything in the Hells Angels, you know, persuaded him to raise his appraisal of people in general. But I do think that the, that the Hells Angels project had many things in, in, in common with what the hippies were up to. Thompson was no flower child either. Um, so he was a, some sort of like, um, you know, missing link maybe between the, between the Hells Angels and the, and the hippies. And of course, he introduces the Hells Angels to Kesey. That becomes part of the Grateful Dead's community. And so, you know, you're right. Everything was kind of blending together that way. Right. And um, I think, you know, and just as a coda to that, it's really the Hells Angels that introduced Thompson to Rolling Stone. So Rolling Stone starts in 67, uh -huh. but it's not until they cover Altamont in 19, uh, Altamont happens in December of 1969. Uh, that's when Thompson writes to Jan Wenner and says, I love the Altamont coverage. And he loved it in part because, you know, it, it, it didn't sort of gild the lily when it came to the, to the, to the Hells Angels, you know? Thompson knew that what they were capable of. And they showed some of that at, at, at Altamont. And he, he commended Rolling Stone for covering it the way that they did. That's when Jan Wenner invites uh, Thompson to start submitting his stuff to Rolling Stone, which he really needed. I mean, that's when, that's when Warren Hinkle's magazine went down in flames. Right. That's amazing. Really, those connections that took place <laughs> in the mid, you know, in the mid 60s between literary journalism, counterculture, you know, the values, the characters, the personas that were really bumping into each other. That's right. Thank and that's you. what was so formative, I think, for Thompson, even though he leaves, he continues to work with San Francisco editors and San Francisco outlets, most notably um, Wenner and, and Hinkle. And I mean, he takes a little bit of San Francisco to him. And, and of course, there's a whole hippie scene in Aspen as well that he that he hurls himself into. He runs for sheriff, you know, and all that, too. But but the San Francisco piece, I think that's the DNA for him as a writer. All right, we have a question from Greg. Greg, would you like to ask that directly? Let me see. Yeah, hi, thanks. 
Uh, Peter, um, thank you so much for um, being here. Uh, you, you touched upon this, uh, his relationship with Ralph Steadman. I just wanted, wanted to know how much more you go into that in his book, not so much sort of the, the wingman, you know, relationship, but, but the creative partnership that they had. I would really like to hear uh, some more about that, if you don't mind. It really was creative and generative, like we were saying earlier. I mean, there were ways in which Thompson was, was his writing was responding to, to Stedman's illustrations. And, you know, Stedman, and, and, and it went the other way too. Thompson said that he put Stedman in extreme situations to see how, how Stedman reacted to them. For example, Kentucky Derby. Um, Stedman doesn't go to Las Vegas. Of course, he famous, Thompson famously goes with Oscar Acosta, the Chicano uh, activist attorney to Las Vegas, though he does, Stedman does do the illustrations for the book. But when they're together, um, they're really, um, there's really a kind of synergy there that leads to some of their best work. And, and then later um, when people say, you know, how, how do we get something out of Hunter? You know, it's getting harder and harder to get him to produce. And, you know, Jan Wenner would say, find a, find a good bar, put him near, put him near the bar, um, get Ralph Steadman involved. You know, that's when he's going to do his best work. And there were, you know, you have to do, meet all of his other demands, but Thompson's that is. But the Stedman part of it was very, very important. And, and, and you know, Stedman felt tested and, you know, put upon at different times. But I think, uh, I think in a way there was something about that chemistry that really did bring out both of their best work. And then together, it, it was very memorable. You, you can't overlook, it's so easy to do, especially if you're writing a book, you can't overlook Stedman's contribution to Gonzo. Thompson got help from a lot of other people, but I don't think anybody was more important you know, uh, than Ralph Stedman. Cool, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have a question about writing from Bob. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned his correspondence. Uh, it seems to me that the correspondence is really a huge part of his actual writing. Um, can you comment on how that differed from his gonzo journalism and his uh, his gonzo novels? Yeah, I mean, you know, the obviously, you know, he was using his correspondence for a, a lot of other things besides self-expression or or getting paid. He, you know, he didn't get paid for his letters. Although, you know, yeah, well. <laughs> many people did run his letters. A lot of editors just when they got a letter from him thought, God, this is so good, we're gonna run this. You know, that that happened more than once. But I mean, the thing about it was he used his letters also to kind of build and maintain his literary network. Don't forget, he's out in the Rocky Mountains somewhere. That's not where the pub publishing business is. Publishing business is in New York City. And, you know, so he has, to, he has to figure out a way to kind of keep his project going, even though he's not, he's living thousands of miles away from the closest literary capital. So a lot of, a lot of the letters have to do with, you know, that part of his enterprise. And, and Henry Miller did that, you know, when he lived in Big Sur. I mean, how do you stay on people's radar when you're at some kind of remote outpost? And so Thompson had that problem as well. But I think it also was a way he felt free. He felt freer there. He didn't get blocked, you know, he could just let it fly in the letters. And, you know, he wasn't haggling and he wasn't dealing with editors and he wrote when he wanted to write. And a lot of times it was very early morning hours. You know, he had a whole day, he got up late. You know, he had a bunch of stuff that he did with his friends and I, he'd go for a swim at midnight usually. And then he'd come back and then he'd, he'd stay up all night many times. And a lot of times he would make phone calls people did, to friends, you know, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, but a lot of times he wrote letters uh, to friends and, 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 you know, people that he was pitching ideas to. And it just, there's something about it. I, I can't, I, I'm not sure I can put my finger on it quickly, but some of them are so funny, but he, he could also importune, kind of beg a little bit. He, you know, he could threaten people, which he did a lot. Um, and, you know, it was sometimes in jest, you know, sometimes maybe it seemed kind of serious because he would do it to people he didn't know very well. But sometimes it's just hilarious. 
Now, yeah. I'm thinking of the letters that he wrote to Larry O'Brien, who was the head of the Democratic Party at the time. And Thompson offered his services to be governor of Samoa. That's, and he went out and bought some suits. You know, I'm ready. I've got the suits. I'm ready to become governor of Samoa. And, you know, O'Brien kind of went along with it for a little while and then gave up. And then, then the letters become more and more menacing. And, and you know, he's ridiculing O'Brien which is interesting kind of position for someone like him to take. Why would you, why would you go so far out of your way to aggravate, you know, an important American, you know, uh, person in the democratic party? Because he but, bought the suits. <laughs> he had the suits <laughs> and he felt like he got burned on the suits. So, but he would do that. He would, he would engage people in, in that way in a, a kind of a super aggressive way. And so you see that too. And you're just thinking, what, what is this guy doing? What's his, what's, what's he up to here? So I, I just find, I just personally, and I'm not alone. I find the letters really incredible. Do you think he actually published the, uh, wrote these with an intent to publish them later? He that's what them. he did. Yeah. yeah. He kept them and they go back to when he was 10, 12 years old. So he must've known there was, you know, there was going to be some sort of audience for them. He kept carbons. And um, you know, so and he kept everything. So George Washington did too. Oh, interesting. So I think he had an idea that you know that some of, that there was going to be an audience for this someday. He was so pleased when Douglas Brinkley edited them, and they were well reviewed in the late '90s when his own efforts were flagging. You know, his letters were getting a lot of critical acclaim, and that really made him feel good. It was right around the time that Modern Library reissued. Uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and the Las Vegas movie came out. And so he was experiencing a kind of rise in his critical fortunes, even though his own new writing was flagging. And, but I think the letters were a very important part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'd like to um, have Miles speak because he has a nice comment. Let me see if he's willing to uh, say hello. Miles, did you want to talk directly to Peter? If so, unmute. There we go. Yeah, this is Miles. Uh, yeah, I just I read the book, um, came across it uh, by accident in a bookstore, and just said, "Oh!" And then halfway through reading, um, there was a sort of English phrase used, and I said, "Where's this guy from?" And I looked, and I'm like, "Wait a minute! I had dinner with this fellow once." And, uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I just want to say hi. We once had dinner at Jen and McIntosh's house and uh, you gave me a copy of your wow. Gary McWilliams book. So uh, anyway, just as my note says, I just wanted to say, keep up the good work. Oh, thank really you so it. much, Miles. I really miss Janet, but- uh, uh, So do I. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, really, that's really cool. Yeah, that, that, that must've been a little while ago and, and it's been Indeed. a long journey since, but, but I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate people, you know, um, going out and looking at the book. And if you like it and, write, and want to write a review on Amazon, even better. Well, I plugged uh, it uh, already, <laughs> <laughs> but I will. But yeah, I mean, the McWilliams book was really the first of these and kind of one thing led to another. The Ramparts book came next, then The Grateful Dead and, and then the, um, and now uh, Hunter Thompson. And so question now is, you know, another San Francisco book. I mean, there's been three, three on political journalism and three on, um, kind of informal trilogy in a way on the San Francisco counterculture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if, if, if the world needs another book in that area. Some people tell me it does. And so um, I'm still trying to decide what to do next, but it did all start with that Carrie McWilliams book. And, um, and then the teaching that I've done at San Francisco State. Yeah, I wish I could audit the class, but uh, sounds great. Um, I know Coyote's book's pretty definitive on the diggers, but maybe an outside perspective wouldn't hurt, you know. So, oh boy, anyway. what a good one. Yeah, <laughs> Peter Coyote's Sleeping Where I Fall, really, really great book. And, and, and there are others. I mean, um, you know, I, I also want to write about Los Angeles, but um, what, an editor that I really respect said, there's a lot of good books on Los Angeles. <laughs> Yeah, Mike Davis, but uh, I don't know, man. I, I love your perspective. So anyway, thank I just you. want to say hi and thank you. Thank you, Miles. Thanks for chiming in. Yeah, take care. All right, one last question uh, aimed for the writers in our 
uh, attendee list because um, this event was uh, co-sponsored by the San Francisco Writers Conference. Do you have any quick advice that you can share uh, to uh, help our nonfiction writers plow through their work as quickly as you do? Wow, I don't know if I have any general advice. I mean, um, it might be, you know, find another racket, you know, but um, it's kind of hard to say it at that at this point. Uh, I mean, well, I, my you surprise life. me. <laughs> Usually, I mean, writers a... are full of tips. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I continue to think that um, that there's a lot more to say about what I write about. You know, the San Francisco, you know, the San Francisco counterculture. I mean, I think that if you want to write about that, there's there's still a lot of of work to do. And a lot of it has, and you know, between the, the Grateful Dead book and the Thompson book, everybody's, a lot of people have heard of the Grateful Dead and Hunter Thompson, but there's a way that they've, they've turned into stereotypes or car, two-dimensional cartoons. And I think it's, you know, you don't want that, you know, especially if you teach that material like I do, you want, you want to go back and, and look harder. And you also want to see where it's gone, you know, so, over time, you know, we, in, the, in our racket, we call it the long 60s. You know, what, what, did this, what sort of played out in subsequent decades? And there's still plenty of stuff to do there if that's on anybody's radar. Now, I mean, you know, if we don't do it, I'm thinking of the San Francisco Writers Conference right now, there's plenty of things to write about. Whatever you want to write about is what you should write about. In fact, it should be super important to you because it's a very difficult process to finish if you're not very fired up about, about your topic. But I will say that, um, you know, there's a lot of San Francisco stories that because publishing is basically still a New York business, we have to tell those stories. You know, other people are not gonna tell them or tell them the way we would tell them. So, um, you know, I would, I would encourage that kind of work if you're attracted to it. I totally agree. There really is a, a dearth of material on San Francisco personalities and I find that interesting <laughs> yeah I mean we're starting to see more books about tech and I think the San Francisco writers bring bring uh, you know a point of view that that's going to be different from from writers uh, from from other areas and I think that's a plus uh, I'm not planning to do that but I teach that material and I can tell you that I think we have we can bring something new to that conversation that um, will be overlooked by others. What a great note to end on. <laughs> I'm really feeling my, uh, my San Francisco Bay Area roots here right now and I'm fired up. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you for turning out and um, just really having a riveting conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Mechanics. Thanks for everybody. Thanks, Peter, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. All right, everyone, have a nice evening, and I will share the video of this uh, with you later in the week. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good night. Bye.